Hi, Matthew. How are you? Hi, Park. How's it going? I'm very. I'm doing very well. Yeah, I'm doing good. And you're also doing good. Yeah. I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, just a bit of more time these days. <laughs> Um, nice to meet you anyway again, and thanks very much for attending interview today. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for the offer. Uh, it was nice to see that you're very active with these uh, interviews about, like with professionals in the AEC industry. And uh, I'm also excited that you invited me to do one of these interviews. So looking forward. That's great. Um, um, just uh, between you and me, we had a couple of like collaboration so far, and I really liked how you instruct or sort of workshops and also um, you know many uh, different projects. So that's the reason I think it's very uh, interesting your career path in the past, and also uh, what you're doing in your current position is also probably very interesting for many students and uh, professions in our industry. So that's the reason I put you on my list and I really <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Um, could you please introduce yourself, Matthew? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, as you all heard, uh, my name is Matthew. Um, I'm trained as an architect. I studied uh, at the same university as Park at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. I started with uh, Wolf Pricks and graduated with uh, Hani Rashid. And since seven years or so, I've been working at the office of Bonninger Grumman, uh, an engineering office based, uh, originally located in Frankfurt, but now has many offices scattered around Europe, in Melbourne, and also up and coming in China. And I'm also part of the Cranber 3D development team. So working with uh, Clemens Preisinger very, very closely on the whole administration and uh, sort of teaching process of Cranber 3D. Uh, I'm not sure if you know so much uh, about Cranber 3D. I mean, a park, I guess, has used it a little bit in his professional work and he also did some tutorials for us as part of our webinar session. But uh, Cranber 3D is also a, very, a tool that allows uh, engineers and architects to sort of get interactive feedback about the designs in the environment of Grasshopper and Rhino. So that those are my sort of key interests and sort of uh, work uh, environments that I'm currently involved in. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really uh, interesting career path, isn't it? Like as an architect graduates and working in uh, structural engineering office and also at the same time uh, software development team as a key uh, lecturer or say tutor, tutor to encourage people to use Caramba 3D. Caramba 3D is, by the way, um, it's one of the first um, parametric structural analysis tool based on Grasshopper and Rhino. And if you guys don't know, then I'll put the description on down in the description box, the link. And it's really intuitive software, one of the favorite, um, I'm one of the favorite software. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I would like to ask, how did you gain your knowledge and experience in maybe with BIM? Um, I would say here BIM is somehow a bit abstract term, but somehow you always, as a structural engineer or architect, you involved in this sort of process. So I, I think you have always involved in this experience. Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to say exactly how much I'm involved in BIM. I mean, in the traditional sort of BIM where working, for example, with specific softwares, mm -hmm. I recently, sort of in the last year or two, uh, sort of dived deeper into this topic. I'm more involved in sort of the parametric mm -hmm. sort of design aspect of sort of buildings. And um, sort of uh, in our office, sort of we have this very key or core uh, 3D team, which works very closely with the engineers and architects. So a lot of this knowledge that I gained was, uh, I would say, 50% from working, work experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of the tools I uh, sort of learned, of course, is from self-learning in my university time, but also watching a lot of these tutorials and also mm -hmm. watching also uh, attending and uh, reading a lot of uh, conference of proceedings and stuff like that. So it's like... A lot of it's of the self-awareness or self-interest mm -hmm. that uh, sort of resulted in this. But uh, it's yeah, like I said, it's like a combination of both professionals, uh, my own interests mm -hmm. in this. Wow. Uh, the funny thing is that uh, it was never my plan to sort of be in this sort of field. It's just sort of uh, 
happen so coincidentally. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> result, but now I'm sort of quite deeply involved in this whole aspect of BIM and parametric sort yes. of design and definitely a very interesting and uh, intriguing topic, I would mm. say. Mm. You know? That's very interesting. And how, if I, if I ask you how Columbus 3D could integrate, like, I mean, it is already, um, it has already information within this sort of geometry. So it, I would say it is also BIM, like in, in terms of its building information modeling. Um, how, but how Caramba 3D could integrate with uh, well-known BIM authoring softwares like Revit or Archicad or or Plan or something like that? Is there sort of good workflow you guys usually p proceed? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think this is one of these uh, key topics that have risen in the last two years, I would say, interoperability. is like, how do you work with different programs? Because BIM, in a way, should not be uh, uh, a way of uh, sort of a set program that one uses, but more of a methodology in mm -hmm. terms of thinking and working, right? Mm -hmm. So many of the times, each uh, of the different contractors use different programs and not like and in an ideal world, it would be great if everyone used the same program, but this is never going to be like that. So, and we know that we, we understand also the reality of this. So it's also working with how do you exchange this data from sort of one program such as Karamba into another, like you said, Revit or Archicad. And so uh, originally there was uh, some plans, for example, to develop Karamba for uh, Revit, for example, mm -hmm. so that you can use it directly using Dynamo, for example. Mm -hmm. But now uh, Rhino has been sort of excessively or like very, very uh, uh, pushing this whole development in uh, Revit, uh, Rhino Inside, mm -hmm. which has been a major benefit, mm -hmm. I would say, in the last year, where basically you can use all of these tools that we were, uh, that for a lot of computational designers have been using in Grasshopper, and these are now available in Rhino. And so this opens up to a huge advantages mm -hmm. of this. I mean, there's also we've been also working with like uh, John Merchant and his uh, Geometry Gym mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. and so they have developed these great tools which work with, um, uh, for example, working specifically with uh, structural engineering platforms and uh, interchanging or interoperability with Karamba. Mm -hmm. So using Geometry Gym, for example, you can exchange very easily with many different formats. Uh, also with IFC, for example, as an industry standard. So I think there's uh, many different offers, uh, uh, sort of opportunities for this. And you can, at the moment, I wouldn't say there's like sort of one standard mm -hmm. method of work mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. uh, Karamba and Revit, for example, but mm -hmm. many different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a good sort of uh, strategy to, to not have uh, one mm -hmm. fixed method for workflows. That's right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, as long as you can also produce IFC model out of Karamba 3D model, then it's always uh, interpolation between BIM platform is always flexible. Uh, at least you can reference and get the information. Yeah. Or the, that's really good. Thank you. Um, that's a fun, probably funny question for you, but what is your favorite software if you have to pick up one of them um, or among your all your skills or maybe if you don't like software what is your program language your favorite language and why uh, I mean I would say Rhino is definitely my favorite software I mean uh, I use it nearly on an everyday basis mm -hmm. and I like how it's very easy and very intuitive to use I've used, of course, other software such as Revit and SketchUp and 3ds Max and all this stuff, stuff during my work and also studies. But I think Rhino offers this sort of balance between precision, but also a little bit of freedom, mm -hmm. which some other uh, softwares maybe lack. Mm -hmm. And I think um, what is also great about Rhino, I think, is uh, this community especially with the parametric design community. There's like a very, very close-knit community. And sort of, uh, very, everyone is very, very open to sort of collaborate and learn from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is why I feel like Rhino or like the team at McNeil is so sort of successful in this sort of whole strategy mm -hmm. in promoting a software mm -hmm. and sort of using it too. Yeah. In the, um, I think not many 
maybe I'm marginalized, but engineers, but maybe not many engineers actually use Rhino 3D. Um, but do you see it's really easy to learn for the engineers to catch like running Rhino 3D? Is it easy to like running path is not very difficult for the engineer to catch up? Yeah, uh, I think from the engineering side, from my experience, like working with my colleagues, I think a lot of them generally at the university, they not, are not trained in a way to use uh, softwares so much, mm -hmm. or like modeling softwares, as we are as architects. And so it's always a little bit more of a challenge for engineers to adapt to the sort of workflow, mm -hmm. because maybe they are used to working with one engineering software, where such as RFM or like Sophistic, for example, mm -hmm. and then they haven't had uh, or they haven't used much other programs. Mm -hmm. A lot of them might have used AutoCAD for doing basic drawing stuff like that. And Rhino actually is very, very similar to AutoCAD. So you have the very uh, similar workflows and uh, methodology. So I think there, there's a good sort of link to them. And, uh, and this is also something that uh, I've also been sort of working with some of my colleagues in the office to offer sort of training mm -hmm. in Rhino or Grasshopper to mm -hmm. some of my colleagues. Of course, there's always questions of like, why do you do this? And mm -hmm. of course, Rhino itself was not re uh, written as a, originally as a, a sort of architecture and engineering software, but more for sort of product design in a way or like ship building, right? Mm -hmm. But it has so many features which uh, allow us uh, in this industry to work very well in it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's, it's always a little bit of a challenge, but I think Rhino is definitely, in terms of the whole uh, sort of uh, backbone behind it, it's quite an easy software to learn. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started learning it, it took me a little bit of time just to understand it, but now using it on a daily basis, I think it's quite intuitive and quite easy. And now when switching to different softwares, I find other software is very hard to use and very hard to navigate. <laughs> right. Compared to this. <laughs> so uh, in a way, it's very intuitive and easy to uh, run this Rhino software for the engineer also because the interface is quite straightforward, right? So, yeah, interface is straightforward. And for example, like with the command prompt, you can think, oh, I want to draw a line and then you just draw a line. And so mm -hmm. you just type in the line and then uh, it, it can really draw a line for you. So like you might think of an op uh, like a command or a geometry type that you want to draw. Mm -hmm. And most of the time in Rhino, you have it there. Whereas many other programs, you have to maybe search or look for the icon, stuff like that mm -hmm. to be able to, to just draw or manipulate geometry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see um, benefit of it. So I'm move on to next question. As you said, your background or your educational background from your professor, they were like a very well known like a star architects like Wolf, Wolf Ricks or you know uh, Hani Rashid. And one of the things they really encourage is also somehow um, using digital tools and such as parametric design tool or generative design. And I think you are really specialized in this domain, um, specifically for parametric design. You, you have many experience of teaching mm -hmm. and workshops and also work. How do you think in reality, when you in real project or with colleagues, um, the, does parametric design methodology help your workflow? Or when you trying to share your parametric design script or text script somehow, are your colleagues really support that? Or they are more like, ah, this is just um, something that not for them and they run away. How, how do you experience with that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, during the design process, it's always hard to say mm. sometimes whether if projects uh, benefits or maybe hinders the project sometimes, mm -hmm. because uh, if you write a, a script that's actually very inefficient, it maybe even slows down the whole process mm -hmm. and doesn't make sense in a way. So I think uh, the things that I've learned in the sort of few years of working uh, with these tools is also like sort of using these tools intelligently Mm. in a way that it uh, could benefit it. Of course, it can create so many different options. You can explore so many different things, but it can also maybe put you on a totally wrong path mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to say, to find a real, uh, uh, how I say, balance between the two. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's also 
difficult to say uh, if every office will use parametry design tools because, of course, um, maybe it doesn't fit, for example, the design purpose or design office mm -hmm. to use it, or even a specific task that you're doing. Mm -hmm. when we, you don't use Grasshopper, for example, mm -hmm. for every task you do. Sometimes it makes sense just to draw a line by just drawing it. Or, um, And I think, like you specified, like communication is also very difficult because you might develop this crazy, uh, this really nice script that you think works very efficiently, and then you share it with your colleague, and they open it. They have no idea how it works. Yeah. And this is also uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, like Clemens also always uh, mentions is like when people ask us uh, for support on their scripts, we always ask them to sort of simplify their script so that we reduce the the, the problems either to the core yeah. and then eliminate the unnecessary information so that we can concentrate on what's necessary and not have to spend an mm. hour just trying to understand the script, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that also people have to learn and it's not so easy to, to learn. If there's not really a standard at the moment, like BIM has a standard on how you set up your files or stuff like, stuff like this at the moment. There isn't really a mm -hmm. standard on parametric design, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's uh, definitely not easy, but it offers a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, in we, I think as a student, I also had these issues a lot that I tried to explore different things and I spent a couple of days working on script and in the end it doesn't really do what I want to do. <laughs> and then maybe I've wasted a couple of days, but it can also be, but this is also part of the design process too, <laughs> right? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think exploring different options, yeah. Yeah, but it's a really good point that um, yeah, parametric design definitely could help some point, but it's depending on how, like, all the project team organized the script each other, and you, you, as you mentioned, that if there is some st internal standard or with external company, if they have sort of set at the beginning how to share the script together that would definitely help to uh, eliminate like a little of this sort of um, let's say debugging process or to un to understand the script is always takes time but I think um, many case people uh, misunderstood about parametric design that it just makes some change some variable and it automatic updates everything yeah. <laughs> but it, it is not it you need a lot of engineering uh, knowledge and you know programming knowledge and also the logic so i think matthew point out the exactly important point so thank you very much for that um maybe this question um could be a little bit tricky but what is your perspective on beam and the industry is beam future or is it present? What is your perspective? I mean, uh, like I said, I'm not too much uh, too much of an expert on BIM itself in the industry of BIM, but I think uh, there are definitely a lot of advantages mm -hmm. to BIM, and I see that also in our sort of working environment a bit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, uh, BIM, of course, is like this idea that you have the information in the model, and the sort of traditional way of building was just to do 2d plans and sections right mm -hmm. and then it's no none of this information is, uh, is in the model and today these uh, in, like for example today's building industry uh all these buildings are so complex there's so many people involved and i think it's actually very important to mm -hmm. at least use some aspects of bim right mm -hmm. so you can actually coordinate between different parties uh, not only in 2d but also in 3d i think is also very important because you cannot totally understand everything uh, only in a 2D drawing, for example, mm -hmm. because like I said, uh, although a building might look simple uh, in plan, it's actually very complex in three dimensions and sometimes you miss a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, some of my experiences I've known uh, too that, uh, I mean, even having a basic 3D model, even if it's not sort of BIM standard, mm -hmm. uh, helps a lot with understanding geometry coordinating with everyone mm -hmm. and uh, of course then when you add different levels of uh, complexity and information to the model it uh, definitely could benefit but then maybe also some people get lost in this whole mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Beam process in a way so <laughs> yeah, especially you guys dealing with such a complex projects in most of case geometrically really complex so i guess um let's say beam in 
your practice is always um, very important, I guess, now and also. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's important, but I think it's also important that uh, the partners that you work with can also understand the potential of BIM too. And, uh, and I've, um, I'm, I'm not sure also from your experience, because maybe in my experience here is that um, uh, I've noticed that especially maybe in Austria, but also maybe in Central Europe, BIM is generally not such a big standard at the moment. It's up and coming. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a lot of people are sort of taking it up into the whole planning process. Mm -hmm. But from my sort of colleagues who are working maybe in Australia or like in UK or like in Asia, mm -hmm. it's such a it's a much bigger topic, a much bigger theme. Yeah. And here it takes a bit more time to sort of pick up. Mm -hmm. and, you know, That's indeed, it's really true indeed. Um, um, both you, we had, I also was in Australia back in 2009 when I worked in architectural practice. Yeah, indeed, in, even it was um, 13, 14 years, 15 years ago. Wow, the time is crazy. <laughs> the um, <laughs> BIM workflow uh, was very, it's very supported in Australia and really developed uh, in a way. Everybody supports and follow new, new technology. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure um, the, uh, the Asia, but as far as I know, uh, in Singapore, um, it's really uh, advanced um, in in this uh, BIM standard. Um, my experience also in Central Europe, yes, it is a little bit slow uh, in comparison to maybe UK or America. Um, but what is interesting for me in Central Europe in BIM perspective, that here the culture and language or national standard is a lot of difference between the countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow everybody using different software, which is yeah. I found is really interesting because back in my co country, Korea, everybody's just using Autodesk product and it's kind of very, you know, limiting the, 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 uh, the difference or variation of uh, workflow. But in, yeah. in Europe, I found it somehow it's really mixed and used different tools. So this open beam, let's say open beam, yeah. or the real mm -hmm. beam is happening. But it, maybe because of that, it's a little bit slow because not everybody following the same uh, kind of pipeline. So Yeah, I agree. And I think this is definitely something I've also noticed in our sort of work environment that uh, especially here is that it's not concentrating on software, right? In terms of BIM, where many countries, like you said, mm -hmm. I think also in Australia, for example, as you graduate from architect, you will look for a job. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say 99% of the time they look for Revit mm -hmm. skills mm -hmm. as as a standard, mm -hmm. whereas Revit is not is not necessarily the standard for BIM, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many other potential uh, sort of programs or tools that one can use also yeah. to achieve uh, the same sort of level of uh so the standards right mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's right um next question matthew could be very interesting for architects uh, who is interested in working for structural engineering office um, as far as i know there are many architectural i mean the structural office offers architect to join i mean mm. one of your companies also one of them or you know many like a um, like well-known engineering office, they offer a position for architects. How is it like working, you know, you as an architect or architect background working in structural office? Um, I guess it's a huge challenge for for you know someone who just uh, about to know structural uh, planning or design. How is yeah, it like? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, I remember when I first started, I was quite excited, but also a bit also nervous, right? Because mm -hmm. I definitely don't come from this sort of background or where I study a lot of engineering or civil engineering, for example. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, but the exciting thing, I think, for me is that I get to work on uh, sort of very, very different projects and very different architects uh, uh, from from very, very simple buildings uh, through to very, very complex structures, like as you mentioned. And uh, I think one of the key reasons why a lot of engineers see potential in uh, hiring architects, and I think one of the advantages I see is that, for example, in our sort of 
team. We have maybe around 40 people in Vienna, maybe around five or six of us are architects. And so it offers a different perspective, right? I'm thinking there's always this traditional approach from architecture engineering that the engineers and the architects are always enemies in the project, right? Because the <laughs> architect does something crazy and the engineer uh, says no and says uh, design everything orthogonal or straight and adds columns everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very, very wrong approach because uh, we also have to work collaboratively. And I think uh, having architects in the engineering team that they also help the architect to understand what the engineer is proposing, but mm -hmm. vice versa, they help also the engineer to either understand uh, what the architects are proposing, but also when the engineer proposed something, uh, we can also offer some feedback in terms of uh, uh, an architectural perspective or an aesthetic perspective too, and not just a, from a calculation point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it is definitely challenging because like, we have to think uh, of uh, different aspects in a way. But um, uh, like I said, what is nice is that we get to work on very, very different aspects of uh, design. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, one thing I maybe do, don't miss is like uh, creating all these door schedules that I love. <laughs> <laughs> Architects are <laughs> well known to do, for example. But of course, we are then not so much involved in the sort of core or con like key design process from the architectural point of view, but we, of course, have a lot of input in the sort of design development of all. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. You can, it's, uh, it's also like, it's always like a balance between. Balance between, the, uh, yeah, aspects. that's really interesting and very, thank you very much for the, um, yeah. the comments on it. Um, yeah, so now back to academic um, area, do you think students of building industry or including maybe facility management or one side industry at university, do you think should they learn about maybe beam or parametric design? Um, do you think it's necessary at university? I, I think it's definitely important to learn about uh, so, so the whole theory, I mean the theory or the uh, sort of thinking behind these two things. And I think it's also good that the students also uh, maybe use it in sort of maybe uh, not specifically in the project sense, but uh, use it in their sort of studies to an extent to investigate different uh, sort of aspects of it. But I think uh, they maybe shouldn't become like a slave to parametric design or a slave to BIM mm -hmm. and only go for one direction. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that they understand this, right? Mm -hmm. the, the concepts behind the two because uh, sometimes maybe students then, uh, a typical example is then they, they bring their sort of designs into Crumba and then Crumba says that it's uh, standing and then they think, okay, yes, this is uh, going to work. <laughs> but of course, there's a whole lot of thinking behind the design stuff and as other aspects behind the two that add to this thing. So it's not just about using the software and then not understanding what it actually does. <laughs> but I think it's more important to actually and know what the thinking behind these mm -hmm. two aspects are, mm -hmm. and then use it in a sort of a how it can be used in a uh, sort of useful way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, this is also one thing I also learned that uh, maybe not so much for parametric design, but especially for BIM, this is something that you definitely l learn and pick up a lot more in the working mm -hmm. environment, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can only do so much in the university. Mm -hmm. uh, related to BIM, uh, and, uh, unless you have work experience, I think it's uh, limiting mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, yeah. yeah. I think BIM is very practical um, approach, let's say. It, it's funny terms, but when you look at PhD um, research about BIM, it's more or less oriented to very practical uh, Research, whereas uh, parametric design or generative design is very theoretical. It, mm. it it has a lot of potential in many different fields. So I think you have hit the point. <laughs> and so the next question is really also related to the students. They often ask me question, uh, which I cannot really. I mean, I give the advice, but it's difficult to answer. But probably you are the right person to ask. The some of the graduates or students at university wondering how they could enhance their parametric design skills, or they want to find their career path in this field of parametric design, but they have 
difficulty to find the right firm where they offer uh, the project dealing with parametric design or process. And it's not only for the designer or architect or engineers, the, the students uh, in general, they struggling to run this um, specific tools or the right workplace. Do you have some advice for that, how they can? Mm, this is yeah. This is a difficult question, and it's. I think it's always a hard. Yeah. Uh, I often get it a lot too. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's that not necessarily one method. I think one useful method is to sort of. This is something that maybe I'm, in a way, missed a bit uh, when I was a student. Was like, I think uh, you when you start to get to know uh, people who are already working in this sort of design, uh, in this parametric design industry, or like working with combinational design, like attending maybe workshops mm -hmm. or conferences that mm -hmm. focus on these aspects. Mm -hmm. Because then you can really see, okay, what are the sort of companies or what is the current research which is being done in this field? And then you can sort of position yourself, oh, I might be interested, for example, in sort of a parametric design for sort of uh, in, in the direction of structural Design, uh, engineering, or I might be more interested, for example, in AI techniques or machine learning, stuff like that, which is a very popular topic. And there you can sort of position yourself, I think, uh, and say, okay, I would be maybe more interested in, in, in a research, mm -hmm. more oriented direction, right? Mm -hmm. And then either in a university or a research institution, institution, or maybe, I mean, there are always then specific companies who are very much involved in sort of 3D printing or like, mm -hmm. uh, sort of this uh, pushing the boundaries of, um, uh, so now, for example, LCA mm -hmm. uh, analysis too. So uh, this is definitely one point that I think is very important sort of, uh, and where you can build a sort of knowledge or even a network Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, people who are involved in this, of course, uh, mm -hmm. you know, instructors or teachers can also offer you some input mm -hmm. into this too. But mm -hmm. I guess they would sh uh, they would have a lot of uh, context or uh, uh, knowledge in this field, especially. And I think uh, also uh, one aspect I think uh, which is important is to when maybe when applying to companies is not just to uh, sometimes uh, less is more in a way for <laughs> example not put, like spamming your portfolio with like too many different projects of different uh, different crazy designs that you created but maybe concentrating on like key projects that uh, really show different uh, techniques or design aspects that you investigated and really pushing these uh, sort of so maybe parametric design tools, right, that you used or developed during uh, these uh, projects mm -hmm. in a way to sort of uh, position yourself as well mm -hmm. in more of a uh, direction, I would say. Yeah. And like I said, it's not very easy, and I think uh, definitely not every office uh, offers this sort of parametric design field, right? So sometimes it might just be a very simple facade. Mm -hmm. Development, where sometimes it's a very very complex of building uh, structure, mm -hmm. so there are varying sort of complexities in I would say in mm -hmm. pyramid design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So I think workshop is also a really good solution to learn mm -hmm. because it's workshop seems like just three days or four days, five days maximum uh, in general. But actually to have the workshop, the tutors or the, the instructors preparing for maybe years of their research or like many experience of their life, uh, like, you know, so it is actually really, com it's a compact, uh, um, very intensive uh, knowledge setting. So I, I really also agree that no work attending workshop is one of the good solution, not only to run, also networking and maybe yeah. you, you find um, some sort of your the students they could find the path yeah. to for their future future for sure that's a really good point and um portfolio you mentioned yeah i really agree that shouldn't just put whatever from first year to fifth years of work in one portfolio doesn't it's not really necessary i think and as you mentioned just specific project that shows the skill set what they want to achieve in their uh, job finding it will be definitely helpful for the students 
All right, Matthew. I have my uh, last question now because of time. Mm -hmm. um, to me, as t every day I'm trying to learn something, especially these days where pandemic time has a little bit more time at home. So I'm learning. I'm trying to learn more like programming and um, game development. Maybe more interested in these days the uh, virtual reality and argument reality to deal with more showing for me the visualizing uh, the idea. Uh, mm. So I'm learning something every day, and I'm I'm just wondering what would you like to learn in your career or life? I don't know, like anything you trying to learn something in the in the future or now and then. Yeah, I mean, um, this has uh, been this has actually been also a goal of mine or like an aim of mine for a couple of years. Mm. It's always difficult to find time was to sort of learn more to dive more into this whole programming mm. language. So it's stuff like I have a little bit of understanding of, but I can't say I can program like from start in in Java or in C sharp, for example. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I definitely would like to get a bit more into, and especially mm -hmm. now with the whole development of pushing more, more into the web or like uh, develop more software development, right? So mm -hmm. you can uh, achieve a lot more things also through this uh, using programming, different programming languages. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something that I would definitely love to get more into. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's definitely more on the professional side and where I'm also currently also sort of investigating more on my sort of artistic design side is uh, doing a little bit more 3D printing to investigate this and so mm -hmm. test different uh, sort of uh, possibilities for 3D printer too because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes from working too much it's also good to have a break and sort of design stuff and then make stuff too right so yeah. it's always it's be nice to uh, and also there's something I missed from the, the student days a lot of the time we're now con as computational designers right we're always spending our days on the computer mm -hmm. whereas in the university we could actually play around with model building and stuff, um, more different stuff like this so i think it's also good to sort of investigate a bit yeah. more of this wow never ending uh, never ending story <laughs> yeah so it's always a never ending story hopefully time is always the big <laughs> time time is enemy yeah right yeah. but thank you very much for your humble and like really honest uh interview today it definitely help a lot of students and also educators even professions or maybe employers who seek for the new colleagues it's definitely a lot of um, um, knowledge you share today I really appreciate it and um, by the way Matthew is very active um, in a Karamba 3d workshop now and then at least how, how often are you uh, offering the workshop by Karamba 3d annually? Uh, I think we I mean we do I would say maybe six workshops a year or something like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, now most with the pandemic, I guess everything's sort of happening online. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the past, we will be doing quite a lot of workshops. Me, Clemens, and the team, for example, are quite active in workshops and also in conferences. And so I'm looking forward to the time that we can actually attend these and teach these in person once again because. Mm. One thing I've also found is uh, these digital workshops. Uh, it's you you lose the sort of human touch, which is I think important mm -hmm. too. That's yeah. right. It's not easy to capturing yeah. all mm -hmm. this uh, tangible human feeling in online workshop. But um, thank you very much, Matthew, for today. Yeah. It was really nice thank to talk to you again, and hope you have a nice Easter holiday then. <laughs> thank you very much. I hope, we hope you to have one too. Yeah, we catch up in Vienna when, whenever um, this yes. sort, of, sort of pandemic time is over and yes. definitely catch up again. Thank you, yeah. Matthew. Then bye bye. Have a Thank nice you. day. Bye.